Great. Thank you very much. Welcome. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, as we continue this afternoon with our discussion. We've been joined by Mr. David here, Dr. Mercado. He probably has some insights that he's taken from the various presentations uh, this afternoon and this morning. Are there one or two points that you would like to highlight from the presentations, sir? Okay. Okay, now no, thanks, uh, Program Director. Yeah, I, I think the observation that I've made uh, since this, this, this morning, all the presentation, they were able to share some insight in relation to what we expected. I think when we were conceptualizing uh, the, 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 the country report, I mean, there was a scope that we provided for the provinces to, to focus on. One of the things that the provinces need to focus on was to indicate things that have uh, worked and things that didn't work well. And uh, all the presentations uh, from the morning, I was able to pick up two or three things mm -hmm. that uh, the provinces uh, uh, shared uh, uh, since this morning. Uh, one of the things that came out uh, very strong strongly was the issue of adaptive governance, mm -hmm. that in case there is a pandemic, it means we need to have the government that is able to adapt uh, so that uh, the government is able to deal with the, with the pandemic, uh, which was highlighted by the Western uh, Cape, Cape province in terms of the, of the governance. Then there was also the, uh, the approach that was used by Western Cape with regards to making use of the repeat assessment on the approach uh, with regards to dealing with the, with the pandemic, where also they've touched into the issue of hotspot strategy, mm -hmm. that as a way of intervention, they had to conduct quick, quick evaluation so that they can get a, a feel in terms of what is happening on the ground and so that they are able to intervene accordingly. And another area that came out strongly is the issue of integrated planning uh, and budgeting. That uh, the process that we are doing is not only to focus on the documentation, but we want also uh, this process to inform the monitoring and planning going forward. Then I was also happy to hear that most of the province and also the Eastern Cape, they said some of the things that they've picked up, they are going to embed that in the MTSF which means that uh, they are using some of the uh, lessons or the findings that are coming out of the, of, of the differentiation. By KZN, the issue, the importance of monitoring of, of intervention and cl clustering of, of, of department as, as well of intervention to, to bring different departments or different stakeholders to be able to intervene. Then I think that's other, uh, I think, operating model that uh, will need to be carried forward. And some they've recommended that, uh, I think Pumalang, to say they're going to de also develop the standard operating procedure uh, to make sure some of these good, uh, best practices, they are, they are going to be able to carry them forward. But other part, I think the investment on ICT, that uh, it, it was highlighted as one of the area of, of ICT infrastructure, uh, so that uh, a lot was able to be, to be achieved uh, by uh, organizing a number of, 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 of meetings mm -hmm. uh, at a short uh, period of time involving uh, different stakeholders. And if the stakeholder have to meet physically, some of these meetings, they were not going to be feasible. I think those are some of the things that I've picked sure. up that came out uh, since Great. this morning. No, thank you very much for those insights. As much as the presentations are focusing on the operational issue to respond to what is happening, you being in the monitoring and evaluation department, there's no doubt that there are some insights or ideas that you are generating out of their presentations to say, what would the uh, monitoring and evaluation uh, function of the future will look like? Because it's also been tested by this pandemic. How do you continually assess and make sure that you are picking the right elements, the right indicator? One of the presenters had said that some of the interventions were not necessarily, or the indicators were not responding to the interventions, which to some extent also talks to 
how monitoring and evaluation gets implemented during this type of uh, crisis. Mm. So are there some insights that you perhaps have already generated out of that, strictly from a monitoring and evaluation point of view? Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I will say uh, on, 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 on Monday and, 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 and Tuesday, we had uh, what do we call the mini workshop where we were taken through uh, this, the members of the senior managers in, in, in the department. Mm. But the purpose of the mini workshop was for, for the senior managers to internalize uh, some of the findings that are coming out from different uh, chapters. If it's a chapter on education, on health, it means they will be able to pick up the issues. Like there were issues that were highlighted related to education on ICT that uh, most of the, uh, of, of the learners that in maybe quintile one, two, three, they were disadvantaged as compared to uh, those learners that are more in an uh, advanced uh, uh, school. Mm -hmm. Then it means going forward in terms of the intervention and monitoring and planning. Then there's a need also to look in terms of the ICT to make sure that if we experience pandemic, the learners from the uh, quintile one to quintile three, they are not uh, disadvantaged because of the ICT. And, and this also applies to rural areas where the issue of connectivity and infrastructure is a, is a challenge. Then some of this intervention, I think, is part of the economic recovery plan. The emphasis on the issue of, uh, of infrastructure, I think, is one of the interventions to make sure that some of the shortcomings or challenges that were identified uh, during the pandemics, I think they will receive the necessary attention. Mm -hmm. uh, and from the department, we are going to also monitor the implementation of the economic recovery plan. I like the point you are highlighting regarding infrastructure because COVID has highlighted the deficit when it comes to infrastructure rollout, like in the rural areas, kids studying from home, they need connectivity, not just connectivity, it's got to be affordable, so to speak, because just having coverage is not enough if I cannot afford it. Mm -hmm. So my question then is, mm -hmm. what are the some of the discussions taking place regarding closing that infrastructure gap especially when it comes to mm. connectivity ah, okay but yeah I, I think with regards to the issue of connectivities i think we need to applaud the role that was played by some of the uh, I, I think it company that came into play with regard to the zero rating with regard to lena so that they are able to access uh, the material uh, in terms of the of the website but also the learners, especially at tertiary level with regards to the issue of data subsidization, so that learners, even if they are in deep rural areas, then they were given uh, data so that they are able uh, to continue uh, with the learning. I think such kind of uh, partnership with various uh, private companies, because as government alone, I don't think government will be able to solve all the the, the, the challenges. I think the role of, of different uh, role players, uh, the private sector, the civil society, I think, I think also is, is critical because the intervention was not only by the private sector. There have been a number of civil society and NGOs that intervened and supported. I think there is a chapter uh, that covers the civil society intervention that has been uh, 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 compiled to document the intervention that has been done. It also demonstrated uh, the, the, the intervention that was done also by the NGOs, mm -hmm. not only on the ICT part, but also in relation to the food intervention and, uh, and the distribution, which shows the, the importance of partnership with uh, different role players. Great. And you're also highlighting the fact that the government will need the private sector to close the infrastructure gap. In the past few years, the rhetoric has been that the, 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 the collaboration between government and private sector has not been what it's supposed to be. But going forward and learning from COVID, we do realize that we need a stronger collaboration between the two uh, parties. So what are the plans to cement the collaboration between private sector and public sector? Or what are ideas that are being circulated Okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I would say with, with regards to yeah, yeah, the, the the partnership with different uh, role players, 
there is uh, i think engagement i think that is driven by the by the presidents uh, with regards to meeting the the nedlec where different uh, role players uh, they are engaged uh, and involved in terms of some of the development that need to be prioritized and 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 and, and some of the of the challenges then also i, I think that also goes to a number of, 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 of regulations uh, that now have been uh, uh, modified or, uh, to intervene, uh, to contain uh, the, the pandemic. I mean, the, the government or different sectors, they, they engage the relevant uh, stakeholders to make sure that they also provide the, the inputs so that the economy also is not compromised. There should be a balance between the economy and the livelihood. And I think that's how now the situation in terms of the economy, in terms of, of picking up, I think it's that engagement and involvement also with the, uh, the private sector and all the, the, the stakeholders. Great. Thank you very much for those comments, sir. Uh, we are ready to get a presentation from Free State. Helen is going to take us through the presentation. Um, hello. Hello. Over to you, Hi. madam. Hi. You may go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, program director. Am I audible? Very audible. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, program director. My name is Helen Fekana. I'm the DDG responsible for provincial monitoring and evaluation in the Free State. And I will be presenting the case study for the Free State province. Um, good morning, uh, with all protocol observed, uh, good afternoon, my apologies, with all protocol observed. Um, I'm joined by my colleagues who are also participating in the meeting. Uh, it's my Miss Irene Griffiths, the Chief Director responsible for monitoring and evaluation programs, and also the Chief Director responsible for public sector monitoring and evaluation, Miss Nodi Mochali and their senior managers are also participating in the session. And I've also requested my colleague who's dealing with the daily statistics for the COVID-19 cases, um, and also the report for our command center and the command center have requested him to connect as well, Mr. Jacques. Chair, I'm trying to move to the next slide. This is the outline of the presentation. Um, I'm going to cover the introduction, the background, the purpose, the governance structures, and the case studies um, as indicated earlier. I will skip or I will just summarize the introduction for the sake of time. Uh, we started working on the case studies last year uh, the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation in the Presidency, they developed a conceptual framework for the development of a country report on measures that were put in place in South Africa to combat COVID-19. And what we did as soon as we received the concept document from DPME, we also developed our own framework for the Free State Province, which actually helped us to be able to monitor the interventions um, the successes, the challenges, the lessons learned, and also document the recommendations for various case studies for the province. On this slide, I will cover the issues around the Free State. We had our first confirmed COVID-19 cases in the Free State. They were recorded on the 26th of March. 2020, a large number of people were infected at a church gathering held uh, for four days. That was between the 10th and the 15th of March, 2019. And even though it was a challenging task, a task for the province to deal with those cases, uh, there were successes in terms of implementing various programs uh, to deal with the pandemic. On this presentation, I will cover the key interventions that were adopted and implemented by the Free State Government. I will also cover the successes, challenges, lessons learned, and recommendation. 
And this presentation will also establish where three state provinces responding effectively and efficiently to the COVID-19 outbreak. The methodology that we utilized, it's as follows. The phase one, we conducted the initial desktop study of available information in the form of reports and articles. At the beginning of the pandemic, we were getting reports from departments on a weekly basis. Uh, that changed to monthly basis, and now we are getting the reports on a quarterly basis. So what we did, we, used, we utilized the information from those reports as part of the phase one of conducting the case studies. The phase two, uh, what we did in phase two, we collected more data around the case studies uh, where we interviewed various officials from government departments and we managed to interview quite a lot of uh, officials across all the three, the two spheres of government, which is the provincial and the local government to be able to get more information on the case studies. These are the free state COVID-19. We've got six strategic thrusts, which is the governance plan, the inclusive health response plan, provision of shelter and food, provision of water and sanitation, enforcement and compliance measures, and economic recovery plan. On the next slides, I'm just showing the systems, the information systems that the free state is utilizing to manage the outbreak. This slide also covers this slide also covers the, the information, the another information system that we are utilizing and how the information flows from one system to the other. This is the mortality surveillance process. The governance structures that we have in the free state are as follows. We've got the provincial coronavirus. Command Council, we've got the Command Center, we've got the Joint Operational and Intelligence Structure, we've got the District and Metro Coronavirus Command Council, we've got the District Joint Operational and Intelligence Structure. The current provincial structures are still in operation and they are convening their respective meetings. Even though uh, we have challenges with uh, the District uh, Command Council structures, which are not sitting as regularly as they are required, but they do have their meetings. It's something that we are looking at in terms of improving our governance structure to ensure that all the, all the, all the structures they meet as required and they deal with the issues that they are required to address. This is the structure information chart. I will not go uh, in detail on that for the sake of time. Uh, we also had a deployment of political champions uh, from national, also from the province, both at provincial and local government level. So each district has the allocated provincial champions to mitigate the impact of the pandemic and also to strengthen the efforts of the province. I will now go to the case studies. The first one that I will deal with, it's with regards to inclusive health response plan. Uh, the thrust of the department strategy is to hold the transmission of the SARS-CoV-19 in the free state and mitigate the impact of COVID-19. Below that, I've highlighted the priorities that the province focused on. The first one was to strengthen the health sector coordination and governance for the COVID-19 response in the free state. And the second priority was to strengthen the health information and civilian systems, which I have shown on the previous slide, and also to ensure that the health system readiness against the epidemiological care, including the enhanced capacity um, mount to effective COVID-19 response. Um, the rest of the priorities are covered on that slide. And I will skip this slide. It just provides the context for the Department of Health and also the alignment of their functions or mandates with the National Development Plan. This are what the FIT did to manage the COVID-19 under the health response plan was the daily incidence management teams meetings for monitoring responses and planning, the ongoing screening and testing for COVID-19 targeted screening and testing systems were put in place Preparations were done in terms of the required hospital beds and capacity of the free state province to deal 
with the increase of the virus and the education sector was also supported in preparation for reopening schools to minimize the spread of the virus in the process that was done in the various stage, stages of the pandemic. The Department of Health, um, after the first cases were reported, the Department of Health established a command center that is within the Department of Health. The structures, the governance structures that I covered earlier are the provincial government structures, but within the Department of Health, they also established a command center to oversee all COVID-19 response activities. And it consists of streams that include the clinical human resource, et cetera, and meetings are held to discuss all confirmed cases and guide and, and to guide case investigation, contact tracing, and also MNE for containment and prevention of further spread of the COVID-19. The daily provincial uh, surveillance report are compiled to ensure that all citizens are updated with the current COVID-19 information. And in fulfilling the above mentioned or the, 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 the mandate that was mentioned in the previous slide, with regards to the health of citizens. Uh, those are the broad measures that were implemented. Sorry, Chair, um, I was just moving to the previous slides instead of the next slides. These are the managerial arrangements within the organization, which is the Department of Health to deal with the spread of the COVID-19 virus. This is just the summary or the chart that shows the management structures within the Department of Health. This slides outlines the health approach, which covers the issues around making sure that the information is evidence-driven uh, to make sure that data management is in place, uh, to make sure that the organizational structure is in place and the strategies and the implementation um, are also in place. The challenges that we have encountered in implementing various interventions under the health response plan, uh, the burden placed on public health as the primary response for the disease placed an immense burden on public health care to the detriment of other areas of the health care. And I'm sure this affected quite all the provinces, not only the free state. And there was also a heavy reliance on public sector for guidance and implementation in the early stages of the outbreak. The early screening efforts focused on vulnerable populations due to the ease of access to the population rather than all population groups. And the logistics and safety of healthcare workers conducting screening in the community. Uh, certain community members were not allowing the screeners into their households. And COVID-19 placed an additional burden on the current staff human of the Department of Health, including the need to reprioritize and repurpose some of the healthcare services. So we had situations where healthcare workers were infected, leading to closure of various facilities in the province. And cluster-based infections were a serious problem in the province, such as those in churches, funerals, workplaces, schools. Uh, they fueled the increase in the number of new cases in the province, which is also currently the case with the new, the increase in number of cases currently um, in the free state. Um, I think it started about two, three weeks ago. We started to see a rise in the number of cases again, which were mainly due to the cluster-based infections. Continuing with the challenges, um, the testing capacity of the laboratories, we had a shortage of re regions due to global constraints, which uh, resulted in the delayed turnaround time. The lessons learned on the health response are as follows. The COVID-19, it's not only a health problem, but one that requires intersectoral co collaboration to manage. The healthcare system could benefit from a closer relationship with independent practitioners, private practitioners, traditional healers, and could have taken advantage of the opportunity uh, to partner with the sectors. There was a missed opportunity with general practitioners and any healthcare provider 
where the providers could have been involved in the early detection of the disease from their practices. District specific response are key to the implementation of the COVID-19 response. That is one of the lessons that we have learned. Mass social gatherings, e.g. churches, uh, meetings are potential key cluster for COVID infections. Self-quarantine and isolation of COVID-19 cases and contacts was found to be ineffective, mainly due to the inadequate social distancing and non-compliance to infection prevention and control measures to combat the virus. Essential industries that were opened during the different levels of the lockdown also posed a risk for cluster formation and the importance of intersectoral collaboration through the prof job, which is the uh, council security for the community health workers. Um, um, that's also very important that we, we also work with the community health workers. And, and in the prof job, we've got various sectors that are represented there. Continuing with the lessons learned, um, the key one that we lesson that we have learned is that mass community screening for COVID-19 did not yield enough positive, positivity rate, and the approach was changed to targeted screening and testing. During, uh, just to give a, a brief information around that issue, because we have conducted a detailed case study around that particular topic. During the COVID-19 lockdown period, the Department of Health first used the mass screening methodology to determine the extent of the COVID-19 infection in the province. And based on the results from the mass screening, it became clear that a different approach, approach will have to be followed where after a targeted screening method was implemented. And that approach was more effective and efficient and more information. We've got a detailed case study around this topic and we've got more information in the case study that shows the difference between the two approaches and which results were obtained from each of the approaches. I wanted to edit on the presentation, but it would have made my presentation very long. Another lesson learned is incorporating data valida validation strategies within the formal information flow process, rapid response in, aggress in aggressively investigating cases, tracing all contacts of people that tested positive for COVID-19 resulted in limiting the spread of the infection. Initially, it was crucial for identifying and testing eligible contacts by testing all corpses of people that died of respiratory and cardiovascular conditions. That was the initial approach. Early and continuous community engagement is significant in establishing public compliance regarding the outbreak. On this slide, the key is, is the disease outbreak. That's, I've touched on this issue earlier with regards to making sure that there are intersectoral and interdepartmental approach to maximize the response effort. And screening could have been used as an opportunity to engage the community with regard to sanitation, healthy disease habits, relevant healthcare information, and also improve on non-pharmaceutical interventions within the community. That's what we've learned because that was not done at the beginning and we could have used the opportunity while we were screening people with regards to dealing with those issues that I've just mentioned. And the recommendations on the health response, I will start with the effective screening in all sectors. The recommendation is to ensure all those with symptoms are denied entry into the workplace or the department. All must be referred to testing and referred for testing. Community healthcare workers and people screening, they need the appropriate infection prevention and control. Police presence is required when community healthcare workers and people um, screening are in community so that they can be protected from threats and attacks. Uh, to strengthen and enforce adherence to non-pharmaceutical behavior, the recommendation is that individual must take responsibility of wearing masks, regular hand washing, and social distancing. Each sector company department must ensure these measures are adhered to through strict monitoring. On community engagement, the recommendation is the involvement of COCTA, uh, traditional leaders, religious leaders, civil organization, community leaders. It's very important to ensure buy-in from communities. Improving communication, 
uh, we re the recommendation is that tailor-made messaging using all media platforms to inform to influence all age groups must be utilized. Uh, targeted messaging based on high-risk, vulnerable uh, population groups. Uh, it's also very important because we tend to have standard messages, um, which somebody who does not understand or some of the messages are communicated in a language that people don't understand. But what we have learned is that moving forward, we need to make sure that we tailor make all those messages based on the vulnerable, uh, uh, the groups that we are trying to reach. On the messenger, engagements from political, religious leaders, sports personalities, and celebrities, especially those who have recovered, we, we, that also can also be utilized to communicate the messages around the COVID-19. They have shown to have been making an impact when you have somebody like a celebrity or a sports personality person or any leaders or politicians communicating the messages to the people. Ongoing communication in terms of tra trajectory of the pandemic in the province and adhering to IPC measures, the utilization of integrated health system surveillance and response plan, and also the other recommendation that is that we should ensure skills transfer between local universities and the public sector. As I've mentioned earlier, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was more reliance on the public sector and, and, and we did not work and I'm talking for our province um, very closely with, with, with the universities, which is something, especially when we're doing the case studies, which is something that we will improve moving forward. On the provision of food and shelter, one of the fundamental tools for government through which the fiber of society is built and strengthened its social development programs. And during the initial stages of the DITLA, of the COVID-19 state of disaster, amongst others, there was generally interest and focus by national and some provincial governments on providing food relief to take care of the vulnerable uh, people in our society. As such, measure, measures for food distribution to the vulner vulnerable groups were strengthened. There was also generally a strong interest and focus by national and some provincial governments on the homeless and the destitute within society. Measures to take care of the vulnerable groups such as old age people were strengthened. This evaluation uh, would therefore assess, assess the extent of the support provided by the provincial government to the older population as well during COVID-19 pandemic. Key successes on this particular chapter is the establishment of the Solidarity Fund to support those who live, whose lives have been disrupted by the pandemic, through which food parcels were purchased. That was at the earlier uh, phases of the lockdown. Food parcels were purchased and distributed by a number of stakeholders. And that was later uh, replaced with the 350 unemployment social grant. And relations were strengthened amongst various stakeholders, the utilization of community structures, uh, assisted in the effective distribution of food parcels. We established a departmental COVID-19 coordinating team, established COVID-19 steering committee comprising of the department and labor partners, established the war room team, participation in the prof, uh, prof joints and in the COVID-19 prof job. Continuing with the key successes, the distribution of food parcels, I uh, will skip some of the bullets for the sake of time. Uh, the other success was the rehabilitation referrals were recorded in various towns. The use of NPOs and their volunteers reduced the labor and administrative burden normally placed on the Department of Social Development officials. And below that, it's just the amount that was allocated to the Free State Province from the equi equitable share budget uh, for food relief program. Continuing with the successes, we also reduced health-related cases. There were low incidences of COVID-19 cases reported within the residential care facilities for old people. Uh, capacitation of staff at re residential care facilities for old people. There was a comprehensive pro training program that was implemented. 
quality assurance conducted was conducted on training that was provided uh, with de the development of SOPs on COVID-19 protocols, the Department of Social Development in partnership with the Department of Health and Right to Care developed the SOPs, the standard operating procedures on COVID-19 protocols. And part of the training provided to the staff rendering the care and support services within the facilities was related to the standard operating procedures. Addressing escalation of illegal care facilities for old people, as the Department of Social Development provided training to all existing residential care facilities for old people, the challenge of the escalating number of illegal care facilities for old people became prominent and resulted in the department taking steps to address that. Consequently, the first meeting was convened on 6 April 2021 to solicit buy-in from various stakeholders on the plan to conduct the roadshows with the aim of providing information on, establishing, on the establishment of care facilities for older persons and also to update the database as well. The last key success is the effective and efficient collaboration or partnership between stakeholders. The Department of Social Development joined efforts with various stakeholders from different sectors of the society and different spheres of government. And I will move to the challenges. The perishable food gets distributed from afar and sometimes it is in a rotting stage that may lead to ill health. Uh, that's one of the challenges that we had. The late delivery in some areas resulted to food not being distributed as per schedule. Double dipping by beneficiaries was one of the key challenges where you had a beneficiary, beneficiaries who would receive grants, food parcel from municipality, from mines, from the Department of Social Development as well. The food parcels were not inclusive, were not including the baby and the toddler's food or milk powder, which was also another problem. The social workers and the CDP worked overtime and assisted with the offloading of food parcels, which exposed them to the risk of infection. And the extension of the lockdown meant that children who were receiving food through the National School Nutrition Program were in need of food. I remember the first phases of the lockdown, uh, the National School Nutrition Program was halted. And later on, it was, it was, it was then uh, they indicated that even though the schools are still closed, kids were allowed to go and get the, the food from, from their schools. But basically, once when the lockdown was extended, it created a problem for those children who were relying on the food from that program. There was also a shortage of meals for the homeless in shelters, lack of proper coordination of lists of beneficiaries for food parcels at some point between the municipalities and the various offices of the MECs. During the distribution of food parcels, they were overcrowding due to the presence of other people besides the beneficiaries, therefore posing numerous risks, including the violation of COVID-19 rules and regulations. There are quite a lot of challenges. I will just highlight a few from this slide and not go through all of them. Uh, there were also notable threats, threats from community members due to lack of presence or visibility of the law enforcement. And the department experienced challenges of access and exit control during the distribution process of the food parcels. There were shortages of PPEs. And given the fact that most of the older persons depend on their old age grant, most of them could not afford to buy sanitizers to prevent, to protect themselves as often as possible. And there was no allocated budget for COVID-19 response. The fact that there was no additional funds specifically allocated to the old age program post challenges in procuring PPEs, uh, the um, adequate PPEs for facilities to ensure compliance to COVID-19 protocols. Non-operational community-based care and support services. Uh, the CBC, CSS are daily services provided to older persons, which still resides within their own families. So these services fall into broad categories which covers the prevention programs, which ensure the independent living of an, a, an older person in the community in which, um, okay, the second one is the home-based care, which ensures that a frail older person receives, receives the maximum care. 
However, during the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, the community-based care and support services were not operating as they were closed. And although some of the older persons indicated that they received information through radio stations, etc., which assisted them fundamentally, the closing of the CB CSS post challenges to the older person as no support was provided to them during uh, the period. On this slide, Chair, there was, uh, I'll also highlight a few and not all of them. There were long queues during pension grant paydays. There were limited visitation to the residential care facilities. There were lack of admission in the facilities, which created a huge problem. And the lessons that we have learned, it's the intensive household profiling and community payments. They need to be developed as they will assist in order to have an informed distribution plan to prevent the duplication of provision of food parcels in households. Also, the department reported that as we were conducting the interviews, they reported that they learned that their database of qualifying households could be used to avoid duplication of services to more than one household. But you will find that, for example, with the distribution of food parcels, the councillors would distribute the food parcels without utilizing the Department of Social Development's database, which resulted in the duplications in terms of the qualifying households. The list of beneficiaries should be coordinated by the Department of Social Development and only beneficiaries should be allowed at the distribution points to avoid overcrowding and possible violation of COVID-19 rules and regulation. And the Department of Social Development should work directly with municipalities to ensure that suitable and compliant venues or distribution points are identified and prepared in advance. And law enforcement should always be involved and visible to cap or deal with the threats from community members. And the department security personnel should be assigned to manage access points. Registration checklist of qualifying beneficiaries needs to be conducted and concluded in order to, on, to control access to distribution sites. With regards to collaboration and partnerships with other stakeholders, that is very key. For future purposes, SASA, they need to ensure that the dates for old age grants are not mixed with other grants. Also during the collect collection of the old age grant, the police needs to be deployed to all stations of collection in order to monitor that only older persons are the only ones that enter that particular area. And there is a need for a special transportation of older persons from their respective homes to the points of collection where they need to collect the food parcels. Uh, the food parcels tend to be very heavy and older people are not able to carry that to their homes. So it's something that we have learned uh, that we need to improve moving forward to ensure that they've got special transportation whenever they go to collection points to get their food parcels. Service provision at the local clinics need to be improved to cater for older persons' need. Given the vulnerability of the older persons in contracting the COVID-19, it goes without saying that they should be monitoring at local clinics and they should be prioritized. This is based on the fact that in practice, the youth are prioritized and service provision to older persons is poorly administered. So health prof professionals also lack respect in some cases, not in all cases. In some cases, they lack respect for older people. Recommendations right. is that so older persons are protected by all means and ensure that measures are put in place to limit their exposure to the virus. This is because the death of an older person has a financial impact on the households as they support families through the grants that they receive. All right. Sorry, Provision Helen. should be made to have the chronic medication of all, all older pe persons to be delivered to their homes and the checkups should be done at their homes. Transportation should be provided for older persons living in poor communities and police should be deployed. Municipality and Department of Water and Sanitation should ensure that areas in need are provided with enough water tanks to sustain them. And as COVID-19 progresses, it is important to think about the role of telecommunication, technology, and e-health in order to help promote the social distancing. So those are the case studies that we have covered so far. 
I'm going to go back to our strategic thrust. We are in the uh, no, process sorry, of finalizing sorry, Helen, sorry. the case studies for the other strategic thrust, sorry. which will be finalized uh, in the next week me. or two. Uh, I did sorry, not include Helen. them on this presentation as we. Uh, it doesn't did not look like she can hear me. I will be finalizing. The sorry, sorry, Helen. Process actually at completion stages of finalizing uh, sorry, the case Helen. study for economic recovery. Uh, enforcement and compliance measures, and also the provision of water and sanitation. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. That is the end of the presentation for All right. today. Th thank you very much, Helen. Can you hear me? Hello, Helen. Can you hear me? Am I, I cannot hear what I'm going to do. I I have tried. You can hear me, but I'm struggling to hear you. So I'm going to join the meeting now from from my cell phone. I think the audio would be much better. Okay. If if then that's a situation, uh, perhaps then we'll struggle to field the some questions, but maybe one or two questions for Mr. Godfrey of just a summary from some of the key highlights that he picked up from the presentation, just one or two. I will not field the question given that she's, um, uh, yes. I think, I think what, what I picked up here is that the, the, the similarities of the uh, strategic thrusts uh, between uh, this province and uh, also Houting um, and, um, and KZN to some extent but uh, going deeper into the presentation, they, there was a particular focus on the, the older persons uh, from various dimensions, um, including also the availability of, of services, uh, but also the issue around uh, the illegal care facilities for older people. I, 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 so, 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 and the psychosocial effects, how the province was dealing with the psychosocial effects of, of the, the pandemic, uh, or the, the disaster on the older persons. There was a particular focus on, on, on this particular area. So that, that stands out uh, uh, quite considerably. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the use of, of, of NGOs, volunteers in the NGOs also uh, uh, comes in strongly in this, in this uh, particular uh, presentation. But thanks very much for, for, for the input. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Godfrey. I guess, given the, 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 the situation, um, all right. However, before we move to the next presentation, I have perhaps one more question that we need to address. Helen kept on mentioning that over-reliance on the private sector. Mm. I don't know whether the other provinces, they haven't really mentioned something similar. Mm. Is there a pattern that you are picking and basically what is the major factor behind that over-reliance on the public sector? Over-reliance on the private sector. Private sector, sorry, sorry. <laughs> on the <laughs> private sector. Um, I, I think it's all about the balance. A, a necessity because you, you can't have over-reliance on one party because it has been emphasized time and again that government is not able to do everything. Same, private sector can't be expected to, uh, to do everything. Depending on the situation, there's got to be analysis of whatever the context is and whatever the, the type of intervention is that, that is required where partners have to be brought in uh, to, to contribute in a particular way. I think the compacting system that uh, Dr. Mercado was referring to, uh, that is within the, the NEDLAC system, uh, it sort of makes these things very, very apparent that there are certain roles that are best performed by government. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are certain roles where a private sector can contribute and the civil society can contribute to in, in various ways, depending Great. on the situation, of course.